students, if I mistake, uh, uh, Landau lecture. We, we have uh, Landau lectures, which are organized by our Landau Center, which is sponsored by Minerva Foundation and uh, Hebrew University. Uh, Professor Chiger is a member of National Academy of Science and also of Finnish Academy of Letters and Science. And he was uh, twice invited lecturer in the um, International Congress of Mathematics. And um, many of us know and um, even maybe more uh, had about uh, Chiggers inequality and Chiggers isoperimetric constant. And um, in spite of the fact that we have um, philosophic uh, differences, uh, he considers uh, minus Laplacian as a positive operator and then uh, considers lower bound and uh, me as a probabilist consider Laplacian and uh, then upper bound for the negative uh, um, principal eigenvalue of negative operator, but um, <coughs> this uh, Chiggers inequality um, became very popular also in combinatorics and uh, in uh, graphs and for discrete Laplacian, so it's a kind of uh, hot thing now. And uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, um, three lectures by Professor Chigger. So today's lecture will be collapsed manifolds uh, with bounded curvature, and the next two lectures on Sunday and Monday will be about Einstein, Einstein uh, manifolds, which are very appropriate in Einstein Institute. And um, so please, Professor. So what I want to talk about today are collapsed manifolds uh, with bounded uh, curvature. Really manifolds with bounded curvature, but the more interesting case is when they're collapsed um, in a sense that I'll explain. So let me remind you what, what a Riemannian manifold is. That's the basic kind of objects that we want to look at. It's a smooth manifold with an inner product on each tangent space. And uh, the inner product varies smoothly. Then we can use, we can define lengths of tangent vectors. So we can define lengths uh, of piecewise smooth curves. And so by taking the in, uh, <coughs> of the lengths of curves joining two points, uh, a Riemannian manifold becomes a metric space. And we'll always assume that this metric space is complete. So just a matter of terminology, when I write BR of P, I mean a metric ball, which means just the set of all points, say an open metric ball at all points Q at distance less than R from P. And the basic thing that we want to ask about is what could the shape of such a ball be, um, particularly when, when R is small. So if we ask for R to be small, so that immediately raises an issue of small in what sense. So there's some, some question of a scale when we consider R small, small compared to what. So uh, to put it another way, since any metric can be scaled, of course, multiply, we can start with something. 
multiply it by a small constant. Now, whatever was big is now small, if the constant is small enough. So we could have started with anything and then artificially make it as small as, as we want, in effect. Let's, and that wouldn't certainly change the topology or the proportions of, of what we started with. So we have to make some sort of normalization. So what sort of normalization do we want to make? Well, the natural invariant, I'll remind you of what it is in a second, associated to a Riemannian metric, let's say, at each point, which measures somehow the non-triviality of the metric, uh, is the curvature. So I'll remind you a little bit of, about what that is in a second. So it's natural to make the normalization by saying that the curvature is not too big. That's sort of the most obvious thing. So let's, um, if, we, if we say the curvature has a definite bound, then we've, we've fixed uh, something. And that's what we're going to do in this lecture. But we, the curvature is, is, a, is a tensor. And there are other tensors associated to it. And in the next two lectures, uh, one of those is called the, the Ricci curvature. And in the next two lectures, it's really the, the Ricci tensor that we're going to assume has a definite bound. So, so we could imagine, first we start with anything. And now we could imagine we rescale that thing when we rescale. I guess I didn't write it here. I will write it later. If I make something bigger, of course, the, the curvature becomes smaller. So we could have started with something that was very curved, but first rescale it so that the maximum curvature is 1. Now, having done that, then we can say, suppose I look at a small ball. Can I say anything about the structure of that? Now, once I'm at this stage, it may be a perfectly reasonable thing to do if I'm imagining looking at a small ball to rescale once again so that the small ball has size 1. OK, so I want to say that in advance because uh, sometimes it can be confusing. So often it'll be a useful thing to say we just started with something of curvature 1, looked at a small ball, rescaled so that the radius became 1. And now the curvature after that rescaling would not only be bounded, it would actually be small. Of course, we did it twice. OK. So often, often that's something we'll want to do. Not always, but often. OK. So if I have a Riemannian manifold at each point, the basic invariant is the curvature. I can think of it as a four linear function. Uh, real valued on the tangent space. And it's somehow an invariant measure of the second derivatives in a local coordinate system. So if at that point I, so, so to say, try to choose a local coordinate system which trivializes things as much as possible at that point, you find easily that you can make it look up to first order, just like a Euclidean metric. That is, at the origin of your coordinate system, you can make the gij be delta ij. You can make the first derivatives all vanish at that point. And then the second derivatives, however, in general, you can't make them vanish. And you can extract from the second derivatives uh, this, this curvature in such a way that it really doesn't depend on the particular coordinate system that you, that you chose. And it turns out to be this four linear function. So just for completeness, if you know what the Riemannian connection is, um, I remind you that this is the formula for the part that went inside the inner product. So that's a vector valued function of three vectors in terms of the Riemannian connection. And if you don't know what the Riemannian connection is, um, it, it, this formula won't appear again. Okay. So. Really, the most important thing to keep in mind is that the curvature is this uh, invariant, which measures the non-triviality of the, the metric at that particular point. Um, 
And certainly it's important to remember, as everyone more or less would know anyway, that if I make the metric big, I make the curvature small, and conversely. Okay. So this is perhaps the most important thing to keep in mind. Okay, so as I said, in, in this lecture, the normalization we'll make is just, let's say r is less than one. If I chose some other constant, it uh, wouldn't affect things as long as I choose some definite constant. So let's say one. So now, if I just say r is, is, is less than one, um, that's not enough to say that small balls of a definite size will, will be non-trivial. Uh, but there are some things that, that I can say. So just to have a picture of it, again, this, the next things I'm going to say aren't absolutely essential, but just to have a picture of it, let's remind ourselves that there's this nice map from the tangent space uh, to the manifold at any point. It takes rays in the tangent space coming from the origin into geodesics emanating from the point, parameterized, preserving the arc length parameter. And the injectivity radius uh, is the largest R such that this exponential map is an embedding. So a diffeomorphism onto its image for all S uh, when restricted to a ball uh, of radius less than r. Okay. So it follows easily from the implicit function that this is injectivity radius is a positive number, right? But how to estimate it? How does it depend on the particular manifold in terms of, let's say, some other information about the manifold? So here's one characterization which is relatively elementary and not too difficult. So there are basically two things that could go wrong. So this would look a little bit, this pi would look a little bit sharper if I had said something about sectional curvature instead of the full curvature tensor, but it doesn't matter. The point is that there are two things that could go wrong. Either the exponential map could ha uh, fail to be an immersion, that is the, the differential, uh, could, could be singular. Um, that corresponds to a geodesic having a so-called conjugate point. And the first distance where that could happen, the radius of a ball where the exponential map could be singular, that's easy to estimate in terms of a bound on the curvature. And that's where this pi comes from related to this. Since I haven't said sectional curvature, this isn't quite sharp, but in any case, you can estimate where the exponential map would become singular. But, of course, you could have something like a flat sheet of paper rolled into uh, a thin cylinder. Uh, the exponential map is non-singular everywhere, and still uh, small balls on the cylinder uh, don't look like standard balls. And the other thing that could go wrong it's not difficult to see as you could have a short geodesic loop. So this really, the other thing that could go wrong sort of logically is it could fail to be one-to-one -one, and that would mean you kind of had two geodesics uh, of segments of the same length coming out and meeting somewhere. And then you look at the shortest instance of that and you see that it's a geodesic loop. So. So non-trivial metric balls, if I've normalized the curvature, are accompanied by short loops. That's one way to look at it. They can only occur in the presence of short geodesic loops. And now, here's another uh, statement, another way to look at it, which is more in the spirit of the kind of stuff that we'll want to do, uh, the point of view we'll take more explicitly. If the curvature is bounded, then the injectivity radius um, is small if and only if the volume of your ball is small. And uh, in fact, they can be more or less the same size uh, as they would be on, on the cylinder. So 
if I have a two-sided bound on the curvature, then small injectivity radius is always accompanied by small volume. Or, put a different way, if I have a lower bound for the volume, which is a kind of cruder thing, then I get a lower bound for the injectivity radius if the curvature is bounded. So this is a, uh, a kind of, uh, well, let's, let's believe this. Um, if you think of the picture on the cylinder and a ball on the cylinder, which looks like kind of a piece of a cylinder chopped off, you imagine unwinding it into the tangent space, you can get some feeling that this should be true. So. Now, despite what you might think intuitively from thinking of the exponential map and the most natural coordinates, uh, if you're inside the injectivity radius, might, you, you might think would be you just take the linear coordinates on the tangent space and you paste them down on the manifold using the exponential map. And that's what are called normal coordinates. And they're certainly canonical coordinates, but they're far from the best in the following sense. So, so the, the best coordinates, so I have to apologize a bit for this uh, edited transparency. Um, it, turns, it turns out, see, what, what, would you, what would you like about a good coordinate system? Once, once you knew you had a coordinate system, how would you? tell whether one was better than another uh, for most purposes. Well, you, it's reasonable that you would want to have bounds if you express the metric in terms of coordinates so that the metric is given by these matrix of functions, gij. You would like to have bounds in the ordinary sense on the gij. Now, it turns out that Coordinate systems with the best property from that standpoint are coordinate systems whose function, whose coordinate functions are harmonic in the sense that the natural Laplacian associated with the uh, metric uh, kills them. And uh, so, so for example, just to, to see, um, you could start with a perfectly smooth metric, even a standard flat metric on Euclidean space compose it with some diffeomorphism that wasn't too smooth, and then in the new coordinate system, even though really secretly it's the standard flat metric, it wouldn't look very smooth. So, so the idea here is given uh, bounds on uh, the curvature, which we've assumed, uh, and something else, which is let's say that the volume isn't too small, then how to choose the best coordinate system? And the best coordinate system is one with harmonic functions. And you can now saying that the coordinate functions are harmonic uh, definitely does not make uh, such a coordinate system unique. There are many, there will be many coordinate systems, just as there are many harmonic functions, right? even in Euclidean space, but uh, not just the linear ones. But nonetheless, uh, from a certain standpoint, harmonic coordinate systems are the best. And so here's a definite claim. If it's not too collapsed in this sense, that there's a lower bound for the volume of a ball of unit size, then on a smaller ball of a definite size, um, you can make such a coordinate system so that you have C1 alpha bounds and, and also uh, on the inverse matrix, uh, C0 bounds would be enough and the rest would follow from, from, from this or it might be more reasonable to put a C instead of a 1 here so that you could make the gij be delta ij at the, at the origin. Okay. So anyway, so here's one thing that we can say about what the small balls look like. If the curvature is bounded by 1 and we have any lower bound on the volume, then by going to a definite radius, you can find that balls look standard in the C1 alpha sense for any alpha. And this seems to actually be uh, the best that you can do. The idea why you wouldn't necessarily, even though, so curvature involves two derivatives, right? But it's some mixture of second derivatives uh, to start out with. And, um, and of course, here we're looking for a ball of a definite size. Uh, 
So somehow the idea why you get C1-alpha and not C2 is, is like if you have Laplacian of something is bounded, that doesn't give you bounds on the second derivatives, on all the second derivatives. So it's an idea like that, but it gives you C1-alpha bounds uh, for all alpha. Right. If, if you, you go up two derivatives if uh, alpha is not an integer, so to say, but if you start out with, uh, with C0 bounds, you get C1 alpha bounds. So that's some idea about that. So if the ball is not collapsed in the center, so our curvature is always has a definite bound. That's our normalization. And so now our first non-trivial statement is that if the ball is not collapsed in the sense of volume, if its volume isn't too small, then we can find at that point a concentric ball of a definite size in which the metric looks standard in the C1 alpha sense. All right, so that's, that's something. That's in a way the non-interesting case, but still very important. Alpha can be anything. R of n. Um, well, I guess you can get some reasonable estimate for it. Uh, I don't, I don't want to think too much about that now. It's, it's not absurd, anyway. Okay. So now, what about the other case? So, so given any lower bound on the volume, then by going to a small enough but definite radius, we can get the ball to look standard of that radius centered at the same point. Now, what about when we don't assume any lower bound on the volume? What can we say then about the shape of such a ball? Now, the intuition is that it's not that trivial to have such a thing, right? Because after all, volume being small, so that involves the word small, right? But our intuition is that if I just made something smaller by scaling it, then typically I would make the curvature big. So I can't just make it small in some stupid way uh, and keep the inequality on, on the curvature. So this is the intuition that being small is somehow opposed to having bounded curvature. Now they can coexist, but then they, there should be something that you can say. They, they can't just come together under arbitrary circumstances. So, so in fact, what we'll, we'll see is that uh, although there are many examples of this phenomenon, they all somehow in them have a kind of circular, or one should really say uh, abelian uh, symmetry of the metric. So even though you didn't assume that to start out with, if something has bounded curvature and sufficiently collapsed upon further examination, you will find that the metric has some kind of circular-like symmetry. That's, that's what I'm saying. So let's see some examples that, that illustrate this idea. Okay. So there's one case when scaling something down won't destroy uh, the fact that the curvature is bounded. And that's when it's identically zero to begin with. Okay. So that means that's equivalent to saying that Locally, on some sufficiently small scale, uh, we don't know how small, the, a little piece of manifold at each point will just look like a piece of RN. So that, it, that turns out to, it's, it's an elementary theorem that, that's equivalent to saying that this curvature tensor just vanishes identically. And then, of course, when I scale the manifold down, uh, I still get something where the curvature tensor vanishes identically. So, to the extent that there are, let's say, compact flat manifolds, there are tiny compact manifolds uh, with identically vanishing curvature. Now, of course, there are uh, compact flat manifolds. The simplest ones are tori, but there are some that are somewhat more complicated than that. And uh, in fact, there's a classification. There are several Bieberbach theorems, but one of them says, the first one says that any compact flat manifold can actually be described. Um, it has a finite regular covering uh, at where the covering group acts by isometries. Uh, so it's a torus divided by a finite group of, of isometries. So that's what a flat manifold can look like. And there are interesting flat manifolds up to diffeomorphism. There are only finitely many. And each 
dimension and so on. Uh, the fact that you have a finite covering by a torus, which is a quite non-trivial uh, theorem, uh, so a torus has uh, abelian symmetry. It is, in fact, a group itself, but certainly it has. It's like, if, if it's just a torus, it doesn't come with a base point, but it certainly has an abelian group of, of, of isometries. Yeah. All right, so then another possibility is like uh, the flat cylinder that we talked about earlier. So you could imagine a curved cylinder. So just a, a surface of, of revolution, let's say, about the, the x-axis. So if it's curved, of course, the, the, the curvature will be bounded, but, but not zero. But, and, and again, it will have this kind of circular symmetry because uh, it is a surface of revolution. Right? So now we can imagine just unrolling it, uh, taking its universal covering space with the pullback metric. So that's this infinite strip. Now the circular symmetry becomes a translational symmetry on, on the strip. And now we can divide by a much finer cyclic group. That is to say, we unroll it, and then we roll it up uh, much more tightly. So we haven't changed the curvature at all in this process because we've again divided by a subgroup of this group of translations. So the metric now pushes down again because we've divided by a discrete group of isometries. And so the curvature stays bounded, but we can again, even though it's not flat, make it as thin as we want. So the volume of a unit ball can now be made as small as we want by this uh, procedure. <coughs> now, It turns out that this kind of construction, even when you can't unroll the whole thing, can be uh, performed and the uh, uh, result is, is much the same. So here's, here's an example in the same spirit, but uh, uh, considerably more interesting. So start with, with something. Uh, on which you have, let's say, a, a circle action and put a metric so the, the, with uh, no fixed points. And put a metric on it so that uh, all the, uh, the tangent vectors um, to the killing field that generates this, to the infinitesimal isometry associated with this circle action. So take an invariant metric and such that you take the infinitesimal generator Let's say the length is constant, for example. So here's an example of that. Take the Hopf vibration. So uh, you th think of the three sphere as uh, uh, pairs of uh, complex numbers. The sum of the squares is one. You multiply by e to the i theta that preserves that. So you have this natural circle action on the three sphere. The quotient is the two sphere. It's isometries of R4. So it's preserve S3, so it's, it's as I said. Now, instead of imagining that we unroll it, which we can't because it's simply connected, and then re-roll it, we can just say consider a new metric which leaves the direction orthogonal to the fibers alone and shrinks the directions that are in the direction of the fibers. It's interesting, as I'm sure some of you know, also to see what happens when you expand the, the directions. Then the curvature doesn't stay bounded, and uh, you, you still get S3 in the limit, but of Hausdorff dimension 4, but that's not what our concern here. We want to shrink them. So both, both things are, are interesting. And when you shrink them, it's sort of intuitively quite clear that if we imagine going to the limit, a concept that will become more precise in, in the second lecture, that we should get S, S2 again. And it turns out that you, you get S2, uh, surprisingly, perhaps, with not its standard metric, but the metric of curvature 4. Um, you can convince yourself of that. But the interesting thing, and this was observed by Berger uh, when he was interested in the problem of sharp estimates for the injectivity radius and for manifolds of positive curvature, the curvature stays bounded again in this, in this process. 
And in fact, kind of if you look at it the right way, so take a point on the base, and a little, you could be a little ball around the point on the base, and then uh, take its inverse image under this projection. So now you have something that's a disk across a circle. That you could kind of imagine unrolling. And asymptotically, the shrinking construction becomes like an unrolling construction in, in the limit. And the metric on, in the metric on, on a, a tiny tube like that converges to a product metric. So it's kind of confusing if you say converges and you think the circle is getting short because then it's converging to something two-dimensional. But if you imagine unwrapping it, then it's easier to think about what converges mean, and it really converges to a product of a line and a disk. Um, so that's, you, you have to convince yourself of why that's true or do the calculation appropriately. Uh, but that turns out to be so. So there's another example, and of course, we still had the circular symmetry. Now here's another one with a little bit more sophisticated kind of circular symmetry. So, uh, so take the, the torus times the real numbers, and now divide that uh, by translation in this direction and some automorphism of, of the torus. And so another way of describing that, of course, is you take an interval across a torus, and you identify the ends with some non-trivial automorphism of the torus. Uh, so some uh, matrix in SL2Z, otherwise put. So uh, topologically, you, you, you get uh, a solved manifold. And it's not so important. Um, you can certainly put a, a natural metric on it. Namely, you, you start with a metric on, let's say, R equals 0, and then you just drag it by A to a to the t, so that when I do translation together with uh, moving by this automorphism A, it preserves the metric. So there's a natural metric on, on this thing. And, but what there, there isn't is because I perform this automorphism, uh, there's no longer a T2 action on the whole thing. That is, Locally, over the base, there's a T2 action, but I can't parameterize it consistently as I move around the base circle. Right. So if I look at the inverse image of any interval on the base, T2 acts on that, but uh, there's an inconsistency when I try to make that a globally parameterized. Okay. But nonetheless, I can do, I can start with the metric that I mentioned on the total space and do the same operation of just uniformly squeezing down the fibers. And again, uh, curvature is a local thing, so it doesn't really see that uh, there's a problem if I go all the way around. The computation is much the same as previously. And again, the curvature stays bounded. So this, this one, in this case, would collapse to a circle. Um, so again, it turns out the curvature stays, stays bounded. Uh, it's actually uh, a good exercise to, uh, to try to prove that it stays bounded. You, you can do it in a completely elementary fashion if you introduce the right coordinates. You see, you have locally a torus acting. So you have these vector fields, the infinitesimal generators of this action. So in this case, you would have two commuting vector fields in the torus direction. And now, since they're commuting, you can kind of take a transversal and make them part of a coordinate system by Frobenius' theorem. You can make a coordinate system in a kind of natural way because you have commuting vector fields. And because they preserve the metric in that coordinate system, now your metric would be independent of the coordinates corresponding to those uh, vectors that you made coordinate vectors, which were generators of, of isometries uh, because you started with an invariant metric. So if you, tr if you make a coordinate system in that way, now what I said to do was shrink the metric in the coordinate directions. Okay. 
Now you just suitably make a, a linear change of coordinates that uh, gets rid of that, that shrinking. So that's a hint about how to do this, this computation. And because the metric was, was independent of those coordinates, if it weren't, when you made that linear change, things would blow up. But there's no derivative that blows up because it was zero to begin with. So this is some idea uh, you would have to work it out about how to see that both in the Berger example and in, in this one, when you do this squeezing, the curvature doesn't blow up if you started with an invariant metric to begin with. Okay. Now here's a more interesting example, certainly will be familiar to various people here. So here we don't have just one group acting locally, but a kind of collection of tori and even of different dimensions. Okay. So let's consider a three-manifold, which is obtained in the following way. We take a collection of two-dimensional surfaces uh, with boundary. Uh, we assume, we may as well assume that each has at least three boundary components. So they're all circles. So like um, pairs of pants or things like that. Um, and now on each of these surfaces, we can take a hyperbolic metric. Uh, first, you can imagine a complete one that looks like cusps as you go out to infinity, a curvature, a curvature minus one. And then you imagine that you go out far away, you chop it off, and now you bend it a bit to make it uh, still keeping the curvature, let's say, non-positive. But after you've bent it out a bit at the ends, let's imagine it's a cylinder for a little ways at the end. So now you could certainly glue two things like that together smoothly. Okay. So I'm describing a particular s simple example of this construction. So now we imagine we cross each such surface uh, with a circle. And let's say we went out far, so we made all the boundary circles have size epsilon. And now we cross each piece with a circle of size epsilon. So now we get a bunch of uh, th three-dimensional pieces, each of whose boundaries is a product of two circles of size epsilon. And then it's really a product with the orthogonal direction to the boundary uh, in some little neighborhood. So we can certainly glue these things together piece by piece and we can interchange the roles of the circles when we do the gluings together. So there, um, there are more exotic things. If we were a little more careful about the metric, we could use arbitrary elements of SL2Z to do the gluings, but this is just a particularly simple case. So near the boundary components now, where two pieces are glued together, we have a T2 action. But because we reverse the roles of the circles, interchange them, that T2 action won't extend to into the interior of the pieces. But over each piece, of course, we have, the, we have this S1 action. But when we pass to a different piece, this S1 becomes the boundary circle and it doesn't extend over the other one. But that has its own circle in this product. So now, just by construction of the metric that I've shown you here, of course, we can imagine each of these cylindrical things really has finite volume, like the volume of the complete one. We can make epsilon as small as we want. So actually, the global volume of this whole thing, uh, we can make as small as we want by making epsilon small. And certainly, by construction, the curvature looks bounded independent of epsilon. So here we have a, mix, a mixture of uh, tori acting in the sense that we have some of dimension one and some of dimension two. The diameter uh, gets long in this construction, uh, and yet the volume goes to zero. So not only do, small, do balls of unit size have small volume, even in this example, the whole thing has small volume. Um, and now we see this kind of mixture of torus actions. Some tori have dimension one, some have dimension uh, two, but where two of the dimension ones come together, they're contained in a dimension two torus action. So they're consistent in that sense. Okay, so 
these various examples kind of suggest uh, abstracting them and making the following notion, which I'll introduce in two stages. So, so let's define a topological structure called, uh, by convention, a T structure, T for torus. And this is really more like an atlas for the T structure, but anyway. Uh, so let's imagine that we have on a manifold an open cover, say locally finite, and on each of these U alphas in the cover, there's a group of diffeomorphisms which is isomorphic to a torus, okay? but not, so to say, in some canonical way. And uh, the dimensions might vary, but for every point, there'll be some largest one that contains all the others. So that's kind of the consistency condition. At every point, there'll be a largest one, and all of these other torus actions fit inside of it. Okay. So such a thing is called a T-structure. This should uh, include all the examples we've had so far, and even uh, one which I haven't given yet. Okay. Now, of course, this shouldn't be yet quite what we want. We have to generalize it a little bit because what it didn't include was the flat manifolds where the torus only acted on a finite covering. So you have to just change and generalize the definition slightly where instead of having the actions on the U alpha, they're on finite normal coverings, and then you have the appropriate kind of consistency condition among those. And so such a thing is called an F structure. Um, so in a second, I'll state some theorem about them. Uh, but for the moment, let's observe that because for each point there's a largest torus that acts, the, there's, there's a natural orbit through that point, namely the or orbit of the largest one. And that orbit will be in a natural way a, a flat manifold. You have a kind of canonical flat affine structure. So you've decomposed the your, your space will decompose into these orbits, and let's call the rank of the structure the uh, minimum dimension of all the orbits. So if they all had a fixed point, it would be zero uh, if there was something that was, was a fixed point. Okay. okay, so now here is a theorem more or less from the 80s of Gromov and I, which says, that if you have something with bounded curvature that's sufficiently collapsed in the sense that every unit ball has sufficiently small volume, but how small depends only on the dimension, okay. then uh, this thing will admit such a structure, that you only find collapse with bounded curvature in the presence of such a structure in fact, the structure is essentially canonical. I mean, you can't make it completely canonical because where you're not sure kind of at the boundaries, should I say it's one here, and, or should I say it, it's really two, the dimension of the torus that acts, like in the graph manifold case. Uh, for example, you don't know quite how far to extend out the piece where the rank is two, but essentially, you can describe all the ambiguities. So it's, it's, the structure is basically canonical up to unimportant ambiguities which you can describe, okay? which is basically at the boundaries where the dimension of the torus might change exactly where you cut it. And moreover, you can make it so that the action is almost isometric of these tori. Okay? So in other words, the more collapsed, once it's this small, you will have such a stru structure and the actions will look pretty isometric. But if it's even more collapsed than this, then you can make the actions even closer to being isometric. And in fact, another way of saying it is that you can kind of average the metric over the actions and get ones that's close to this, change the metric slightly, and for the new metric, which will also have bounded curvature and will be close in a suitable sense to the one you started with, the actions really will be isometric. You start with some metric of bounded curvature. 
Now you have on different pieces of the space this compact group acting, namely some torus. So you can average it over the action and now get an invariant metric. So you can replace the metric by an average metric, and now for the new metric, which it turns out will still have bounded curves. Yeah, you have to kind of do it inductively because you have different tori and different pieces, but there is a, a notion of, of averaging it. Yeah, you, you have to kind of do it in a certain order, do it on the, probably the smaller pieces first, and then you average those on the larger pieces, uh, or vice versa, I forget. But there's, there's a way of, of doing it inductively in the appropriate way. You get something that's close to the original one, very close if it were really very collapsed, and for the new metric, it actually has these honest symmetries. And this actually is, is a very important point. Uh, so one of the applications of this turned out, uh, so this is the work of uh, a former student of mine, uh, Xiao Chun Rang. Uh, if, you do, if you do this, if, you, if the manifold you start with has pinched positive curvature, see, then you can actually do this averaging construction. You have to use, you have to be a little bit careful. You first smooth it using local Ricci flow. But you can do this averaging and still keep a metric of kind of similar pinching in the con So that turns out to be very, very powerful. So the averaging is, is worth being careful about because positive curvature and uh, and killing fields, you, you, you can say a lot with non-vanishing killing fields. So one of the applications of this where you actually have to do this averaging and replace it by a metric, and be sure the metric is still pinched, uh, then you get to a much better situation and it has uh, quite non-trivial consequences. All right. So, what could the intuition be about how you prove this? So it's a general talk, and uh, I'm going to say very little in any of the talks about proofs, but certainly you could get some idea by just imagining the idea of rescaling the, the metric. So you're at some point, it's very collapsed, you rescale it, so the injectivity radius was small. For example, you rescale the metric so that it becomes one. So now it looks to you like you have very small curvature, right? If it was very collapsed and you rescaled it uh, to make the injectivity radius one, the injectivity radius was very small, you rescaled it by a large number, now the curvature looks to you like it's zero. The injectivity radius at your point looks like it's one, and the manifold now should look complete if you started with anything of a reasonable size, let's say size one. Now it looks like a complete manifold that's flat with injectivity radius one at your point, as far as you can tell. Now, uh, Bieberbach's theorem, as it turns out, also has a version in the complete case. And uh, so even for complete manifolds, you do find compact flat manifolds inside of them. And therefore, you find uh, tori, or at least on finite coverings, and so on. So this is one way of kind of thinking about how you might show that there are actually tori hidden in, in this picture. And in, in, in any case, this rescaling idea that you, when you rescale, you see something that looks, as far as you can tell, like something that you would understand if it were really that and not just as far as you could tell. So that's a powerful notion. You still have to prove things uh, in such a circumstance, but it's very suggestive. And it's, uh, it plays a role, uh, particularly in the third lecture. Um, so actually, if we're thinking about the structure of small balls from this, this structure, so, there, so on, on, on the one hand, you have these orbits that spread over the whole space, but near a point, so they're consistent, but near a point, they really tell you uh, what the collapse directions look like on the scale of the injectivity radius. 
So, so if there are several collapse directions, like if you had something times S1 epsilon times S1 epsilon, these two S1 epsilons would appear naturally in, in your structure. So in some sense, the orbits encode the collapse part for you. But on the scale of the injectivity radius, not on, so we're not saying that this tells you everything yet about what a, a collapse ball of a fixed size might look like. But it does tell you on the scale of the injectivity radius, which is a non-trivial, that you will see something non-trivial. If you look on the right scale, and it tells you what you'll see. Now, this also, the theorem so far has a converse. And uh, if you start with such a structure, now, as previously stated, you can start with uh, a metric and then make it invariant for the structure. And then there is a way of squeezing the orbits, even for this more complicated thing, provided that the structure has positive rank. Right? So that was an important thing about the previous transparency. I'm not sure that I read it. Not only do you get an F structure, but it's not a totally trivial one. In fact, all of the orbits have positive rank. That was on the transparency, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, the rank is the minimal dimension of the orbit. Uh, so let's go back there. Well, this is the intuition one. Yeah. That's this one. F structure of positive rank, right? It's down there. Yeah. So that's the positive rank uh, is what says that this is a non-trivial statement. Otherwise, the rank could be zero everywhere. Okay. So now the thing is that there is a kind of converse to this. If you start out with an F structure of positive rank on a manifold, then you can find a collapsing sequence of metrics with, uh, so that means the volume of any unit ball goes to zero uh, as you go further out in this uh, sequence and the curvature stays bounded. And again, as you might expect, it involves a kind of shrinking construction in the orbits. However, even from the graph manifold case, uh, that suggests that you're probably not going to just be able to shrink, that you're probably going to have to do something like expand it in the directions transversal to the orbits. <clears throat> now, in the graph manifold case, uh, the global volume, remember, actually went to zero. Okay. But it turns out that that's not possible in general. Okay. Not only that you're not smart enough to make it happen, but uh, there's an obstruction to its happening in general. So given a structure of the type I described, the F structure, it's always fine to think of the T structure. Um, for mixed structures, definitely the sequence of diameters will go to uh, uh, infinity. Um, so you shrink in the orbit directions, but to keep the curvature bounded, you're also going to, uh, depending on the nature of the thing, have to expand in directions transverse to the orbits. Now, you might have hoped that you could still make the, say, the global volume go to zero, as indicated by the graph manifold example. Uh, but this turns out not to be so. So. Uh, so you may remember that there's a connection between curvature and characteristic classes. Okay, so if you don't know this, you have to just kind of believe what I'm saying. So there's an invariant of a four manifold called the first Pontryagin number. It's the first Pontryagin class evaluated on the manifold. The Pontryagin classes can be expressed in terms of curvature. So if the curvature were so Otherwise put, if I have a metric, there's a differential form representing this P1, which is a polynomial in curvature times the volume form. So if the curvature is bounded and the global volume goes to zero, this integral will go to zero, 
this topological invariant would have to be zero. Now, if it's not zero, it's definitely one, let's say. I mean, well, that doesn't even matter. Let's just say it's fixed. So what I claim is that there's a four manifold, uh, there's a four manifold uh, with P1 not equal to uh, zero, in fact, uh, let's say six, which has a non-trivial F structure, that is to say an F structure of positive rank. All the orbits have rank one. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it has this collapsing sequence with bounded curvature. But it can't be the case that the volume goes to zero because then P1 would be equal to zero. Or equivalently, if you know the signature theorem, the signature would be zero and, and it's not. This manifold, by the way, is gotten in the following way. Uh, if you can follow it quickly and if not, ignore it. You take two copies of complex projective space. Complex projective space has a natural action of T2 on it. If you think of it as three tuples of complex numbers whose square absolute values add up to one. That action of T2 has three fixed points. Right? So there are sort of three canonical P1s sitting in it, each of which intersect at a point. And those three, so you get three distinguished points. And those are fixed under this action. Now you take two copies of it, and you cut out the fixed points. And you suitably glue them together in such a way that the T2 actions match up after a suitable automorphism. Okay. And then you get the space. If you do the gluing right, the signatures add, and you get something of signature 2 and P1 equal to 6 if you do the orientations properly. Now, the fixed points were these things that you cut out, but the P1s, the three P1s that sit in each side, there, that's where the action drops. So the orbits have dimension one and not two. Now you, you cut out these, so the, these P1s with the fixed points cut out also get kind of glued together. And you get this closed thing sitting inside where the, the rank of the structure is one. And elsewhere, it's two. But it turns out that around that thing, there's kind of non-trivial hole in them. So although the orbits have dimension one, you can't, in a kind of flat way, make orbits of dimension one in the neighborhood of it. So you want always to divide it up into things where the orbits have positive dimension and constant dimension, and then you deal with those pieces separately. But because there's a kind of non-trivial holonomy around the set where the orbits drop from two to one, you, you have to really expand things a lot there to keep the curvature bounded, is the idea. And so now, on the other hand, even though there's a chern gauss bonnet formula for the Euler characteristic, it is true that the Euler characteristic is always 0. The structure has positive rank. And that's for more or less elementary reasons. So namely, since it has positive rank, you just divide it up into, uh, into pieces. There's no question of making things match when you go around something globally. There's no question of holding up because of the simple behavior of the Euler characteristic. So you, it has positive rank. You easily find such a covering where every element of the covering is preserved, every intersection, every finite intersection is preserved by a vector field which doesn't vanish. That comes from the positive rank condition. So now you have a covering where every finite intersection has Euler characteristic zero. But when you take the union of two things, the Euler characteristic of the union is the sum minus the Euler characteristic of the intersection. So if you have such a covering, the Euler characteristic of the whole thing will vanish. So even though chern bay theory won't, will obstruct in general such a, such a collapse, it is true that the Euler characteristic always vanishes. So this was something that was kind of clear right from the beginning. It's quite elementary. But recently, uh, a further elaboration of this point has occurred, which I want to start to introduce now. And it will play a central role in the second lecture. So, so let me remind you 
about the Gauss-Binet formula. So, um, so there is this differential form. Uh, depends on a local choice of orientation, and therefore, since integration also does this integral, independent of it. Uh, so up to orientation, there's a canonical polynomial form in the curvature whose integral is the Euler characteristic. That's the chern gauss bonnet formula. Now, what I want to say is that there's a way of taking the argument that I just described with the intersections of the open sets and making it more quantitative. So namely, if you pursue that uh, kind of carefully, you arrive at the following statement. So suppose I have a sufficiently collapsed manifold with curvature one. So, so collapsed that I have uh, this F structure, so I have the, these actions with orbits of positive dimension and so on, and uh, okay. So then, instead of just picking out vector fields and uh, using the additivity, you can try to do something a little bit more sophisticated and somehow match things up. Uh, and what you get from that, although to get this you, you need something that I'm going to finish by describing, is that you can find an n minus 1 form in the presence of this structure, associated to the structure, which makes the Gauss-Bonnet form exact. So it's what we call it transgresses the Gauss-Bonnet form. And this is more or less canonical. I say it's essentially canonical essentially in the same sense that the structure itself is essentially canonical. Namely, it's canonical up to ambiguities that which, while you can't avoid them, they're unimportant and you can describe them. And anyway, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that there exists one such form which makes it exact, and from the bounded curvature comes the fact that this, point, this has pointwise bounded norm. So that's what I mean by making it quantitative. So not only does the Euler characteristic vanish, but it's D of a form that has pointwise bounded norm. Now, you can't quite see this from what we've, I've described so far. You need something that I'm going to describe now. But the bound on the norm of the form is what I mean by making the previous argument quantitative. And in fact, the construction of the form is very closely related to that of the collapsing uh, sequence of metrics with bounded curvature. It is because I have to, in some sort of consistent way, get these vector fields or maybe uh, tori of higher, you know, uh, Lie algebras of higher dimension of vector fields, and I use them to somehow transgress this form. I mean, uh, okay. So, as I just said, this estimate provides a quantitative reformulation of the topological argument, but actually to get it, it requires uh, something which we haven't done so far. So namely, we have a good description of what a collapsed manifold looks like on the scale of the injectivity radius. But what would be a better thing to have in more or less the problem that I suggested at the beginning was what can a collapsed manifold look like on a small but definite scale that's independent of the manifold, right? Just like sufficiently collapsed was small but definite depending only on the dimension independent of the manifold. So there, so there is such a thing. Um, and you actually need it to prove this, this estimate. So there's a more general kind of structure. Um, which is based, it's similar in spirit, but based not on uh, tori, but on nilpotent Lie groups. The fundamental thing is a nilpotent Lie group, not a torus, but otherwise it's much in the same spirit. It divides it up into nil manifolds instead of flat manifolds, and maybe not all of the same dimension, and so on. Uh, but if you kind of imagine replacing flat manifolds by nil manifolds, that's the, the relevant structure. And 
this turns out to be adequate to describe balls of a fixed size, namely in terms of the orbits of this structure. Now, why should you need nil manifolds? What's the phenomenon? I mean, it could have been that even though uh, we said we were describing things on the scale of the injectivity radius, maybe that was really all enough and, and nothing else could happen between the injectivity or that we couldn't describe between the injectivity radius and a fixed radius. But the following uh, well-known example shows that that's not uh, true, um, that something can happen. So start with the group of uh, three by three uh, triangular matrices, say lower triangular matrices. And remember that for every uh, T, there's an automorphism of that group. So there's a one parameter group of automorphisms by this kind of inhomogeneous scaling. So if you haven't seen this, you just check as an exercise that this is an automorphism. So, of course, the important point is I have T, T, and T squared. So, this is, out of this we can construct uh, the famous almost flat manifolds in the simplest instance. So, namely, if you take, let's say, the subgroup with integer entries, of those matrices, that's a discrete co-compact subgroup. Now, you take any left invariant metric on this group of upper triangular matrices, and you divide by your subgroup lambda on the left, it pushes down, you get a compact uh, manifold. And of course, the curvature is the same at all points, since it was left invariant to begin with, it was the same at all points. Okay. So now you get a compact locally homogeneous space. Now, if instead of dividing by that subgroup, I can divide by the scaled version, namely, I first uh, I apply the, I look at its image under this automorphism, uh, in, uh, the scaling by T in the inhomogeneous sense. So now, if T is small, the subgroup has become very small. I've divided by a very dense discrete subgroup. So it's clear becomes arbitrarily dense, this quotient group will have arbitrary, the quotient locally homogeneous manifold will have arbitrarily small uh, diameter. Curvature is the same because I didn't change the metric upstairs, I just pushed it down by a different subgroup of isometries. So if I like, since I'm deforming the subgroup continuously, of course the diffeomorphism type of the quotient space doesn't change, so I could as well think of this as a one parameter family of metrics on the fixed manifold whose curvature is bounded by one. In fact, it doesn't really change at any point in, in, in the T, and the diameter goes to zero. However, this is the fundamental, the, the integer group is not the fundamental group of a flat manifold because it doesn't have a lattice of a finite index. It's no potent, so it's not almost uh, abelian. So, so although, although this manifold admits no flat metric in this inhomogeneous way, it, you can scale it in, in, in a more sophisticated sense and get something of bounded curvature and arbitrarily small diameter. Then, of course, you could really scale that one up somewhat and make the curvature small and diameter would still be small. Uh, but now you see that the scaling is really taking place on two different scales because the smallest circles, so to say, will have length t squared, and then you'll have two that have length t. Another way of describing the same example is like with the Berger example. Think of a non-trivial circle bundle, but this time over a torus instead of the two-sphere. You multiply the fibers of the torus by length t squared and each of the base circles by length t. That doesn't disturb the base because the base is now flat instead of being s2, it's t2. So that's a different way of describing the same uh, picture. So the celebrated theorem of, of Gromov said that all such examples arise in essentially this way. 
So anything with bounded curvature and sufficiently small diameter is actually diffeomorphic to such uh, a nil manifold. And that, in a way, got this whole subject of collapsing started and still a cornerstone of it, although in some ways new machinery came in. And the theorem on the end structures, I say here, it's more like a parameterized version, which it certainly is. It's actually better to think of it as an equivariant and parameterized version of it. So namely, the construction, for the construction of this uh, end structure, it's very useful to work on the frame bundle and to do everything equivariantly. Um, so then you, you have both, both parameters and equivariant under the action of the orthogonal group. Um, working on the frame bundle simplifies things a lot at the cost of making it equivariant. So this is a technical side remark, which you can ignore. And now, this is then in terms of the structure, you can give an answer to the question of what does a ball of a small but definite size look like uh, in a sufficiently collapsed manifold. And the answer is it looks like a tube around a nil manifold, always. So the nil manifold is an orbit of the structure. Namely, you have the structure. It may have orbits of different dimensions. But near your point, you go to a kind of nearby orbit of smallest dimension. And then you can always describe it as a tube around that orbit. So the topology will be just uh, that of a nil manifold. And then the tubular neighborhood around that, the, that, that orbit may be arbitrarily small, but the tube around it has a definite radius. And that's what any such ball will look like. OK, so that's uh, the end for today. And some of these ideas, many of them will reappear in slightly different form in the next lecture. <coughs>